I'm going to invite Mason. He's going to come up and read a passage for us. If you come up, Mason. So the passage Mason will be reading for us will be Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 over to 12, just to give a bit of context. Here it is here. If that's too small, I Thank can... You. So number 7 to number 12. Is that okay? Yeah. Ask and God will give to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will open for you. Yes, everyone who asks will receive. Everyone who searches will find, and everyone who knocks will have the door opened. If your children ask for bread, which of you would give them a stone? Yeah. Or if your children ask for a fish, would you give them a snake? Even though you are bad, you know how to give good gifts for your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? Do to others what you want them to do to you. This is the meaning of, of the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets. Thank you so much. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to this time in your word. We ask, Father, that may your word nourish us, may it transform uh, transform us, may we be a challenge, Father, may we know the good news behind why we pray and what is prayer. I pray, Father, that may all that you want to say this morning be said. I pray, Father, that if anything that is of me will be forgotten and anything that is of you, Father, will have lasting effect. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer. A big topic of church, isn't it? It's a big topic of our, of our Christian walk. There are so many ways in which, there's, there's, sorry, there's so many areas in which we can pray. There's many ministries, like our prayer meetings, where we can come pray. There's our Sunday morning service, where we can come and pray together. But imagine if the only time we prayed was on a Thursday morning for some of us, or a Sunday morning for us here, or for some of us once a month. There's something deadly in that. Imagine if I was to come and say to you this morning, me and Zoe speak to each other only on a Sunday morning, 10.30 till 12. That's the time I've given Zoe. Zoe's not allowed to talk to me after that. She's not. On a Thursday morning from 11 until 12, that's when, Zoe, that's when the doors open again so he can come chat with me. And once a month. How many of you here would say, you sound like a terrible husband. <laughs> How many of you here would be thinking, really? You get an insight as to what my marriage with Zoe would look like. Yet, for many of us, that's what our relationship with God looks like. We pray when, when things become fearful. We pray when we're in situations where we need, God, we need God's provision. We treat God as if he's genie from Aladdin. Well, it's, now, it's time that I now rub the lamp and God will come and I'll get free wishes. Our prayer life has become so self, self-centered and self-seeking. I remember someone, uh, when I was at Bible college, asked the lecturer, or the lecturer asked the students, why do we pray? And the question had so much, there was so much, new, when, uh, 
when a church history and philosophy lecturer asks a question like that, you know there's a, it's not an easy answer. You know that there is something in this. I remember someone said, well, he's our good God. He's a good father. So we, we, surely if he's our good father and we are good sons and we're good daughters, we will want to talk to our heavenly father. And I remember the lecturer saying, well, yeah, I get that. Okay, that, that may, that, that is not a, it's not an incorrect answer. But it's not the answer I'm looking for. And someone else said, well, the reason we pray is because we, we want the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to come. And because we are on this earth, there's a big difference between heaven and earth. So we need to pray in order for heaven to meet earth. And the lecturer said, nope, not quite. And I, I'm not exaggerating he waited 15 to 20 minutes and he forced answers out of people. And it got to a point where he says, okay, why do we pray? I'll answer it, I'll ask you again. And I want you to not think of you in the answer, but to think of who God is. And that's what happens when we think of prayer. We think about us in the prayer. We don't tend to think about the God element. And his answer was this. We pray because we are commanded to pray. That was a frightening answer. We pray because we're commanded to pray. Why do we evangelize? Because the great commission commands us to go forth. We are commanded. Jesus didn't say, pray if you can be bothered. Paul's letters doesn't describe that. Pray without ceasing is the rhetoric of Paul. So as we turn our attentions, as we look at Jesus as he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. This shows that prayer is a central part of our faith. Like communication is a central part of my relationship with Zoe. All I know about Zoe is based on how we communicate together and with each other. I know when I've said something that has been, she has taken, regardless of my justification of, you're overthinking what I'm saying. We get offended by each other for how things are communicated. We get frustrated with each other because of how we've communicated. We get hurt by one another by how we communicate. Everything we do comes from a place of communication. And communication between us and our Heavenly Father is critical. Communication determines every aspect of our life with God. If we are not communicating with God, then God ain't communicating with us. I don't like, you can tell me God speaks to me through, through prophecy. I hear God's voice as I walk um, up the brace or whatever. If you're not praying to God, I don't want to hear what God is saying to you because if you can't, and this for me, I don't mean to sound judgmental, but if we're not giving much time to God, then how can we possibly expect God to give much time to us? Now, I'll come on to it that God in all his mercy and all his grace still comes to us and still meets with us, still encourages us, still convicts us, still leads us into repentance. Those things still exist. But imagine if I was a preacher and I said, I don't read my Bible, I don't study my Bible, I don't give any time to my Bible whatsoever. Now, church, as we open up the Bible and I preach, listen up. The hypocrisy. The hypocrisy. We are invited as a people to come in to the presence of God. God is inviting us in prayer. Come and meet with me, my son, my daughter, whatever you are faced with, come. For all who are heavy laden, cast upon 
Cast it upon Christ because he cares. That is the promise. Christ says, whatever you're going through, lay it on me. That's the promise of prayer. That when we pray, all that we face, we can hand over to him. For our young people, all that you face in school, you hear many adults say to you, I wish I did a lot better at school. I will give you one different. I wish I hadn't walked away from church when I was your age. When I first started secondary school, I walked away. I can't be bothered. Like, church was, it was mince. Actually, mince is quite tasty. It was actually, it was, <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy church. The pastor in the church I grew up on didn't show any value to our young people. And therefore, because he didn't, the church didn't. And there was this great divide between what we did on a Sunday morning to what our young people has done. One of the, the youth pastor, Mark, who go, he's a youth pastor at Connect Church, he, I read his dissertation. And his dissertation was the church, in essence, the church needs to get rid of this language that the kids and the young people are the future of the church. His rhetoric was the kids aren't just the future of our church. The kids are and the young people are part of the body of Christ. Part of the body of Christ. If they declare Christ crucified, they stand in equal stance before a holy and righteous God as I do, and that is forgiven. Therefore, when I take communion, I can take communion alongside our young people who profess Christ crucified. That's the pro- that is the promise of the gospel. Ni- neither Jew or Gentile, all are one under Christ. One O U uh, O N E and W O N. So as we step into God's presence, for me, I as I wrote this title, I was like, I agree with it, but I oh, I struggle with it as well because for me, I when I read the Old Testament, the Israelites when they were walking in obedience to God, their hearts were always, we need to give an offering to God. We need to give an unblemished lamb. We need to fulfill these. We need to give it to the priests who enter into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is manifest. The beauty, yes, is we no longer, or we, we were never able to do that as a Gentile people. We fall into that camp. But the promise is, is that God's presence is in us. By his Holy Spirit. So when, so when we step into God's presence, we're not stepping in. It's not like we're stepping in to Tesco. Or we're stepping into church where we, we step in and we say, okay, we now, we've now come into church. We now need to sing certain songs that, that in some way creates a space and allow the Holy Spirit to come in. That is unbiblical. Church history will claim that that is unbiblical. If we in any way, shape or form think that it's up to us to determine the space in which we can then say, okay, Holy Spirit, we have now created a formula, you can now come. Then God's operation of God's providence, what God is doing is dependent on us, then it becomes works. The beauty of salvation is we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own. And therefore, when we come and we meet with God, we meet because God wants to meet with us. When we come to prayer meetings, God wants to meet with us. When we are praying at our home, God meets with us. No matter what we are faced with, for those who are grieving, God's presence is God's presence is more real in this situation as he always has been. God's presence is with us, in us, transforming us. Can I tell you something there? There's, there is no escaping God's presence this morning. We can leave church at 12. God's presence is with us, in us, and goes before us. There's nothing Me and my full family can be in a car wreck next week. And guess what? God is present in us and with us in that situation. 
that actually the, the reality is terrifying. But even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for my God is with me. His rod, his staff, they comfort me. There is good news. So as a church, as a young people, no matter as Matthew Millie's age, that are significantly younger, Micah's age, God is with us as a community. There's nothing we can do where we can create a formula where we say, God, we have, we've done this, we've sung worship in a certain way. We've done communion in a certain way. I preach the gospel in a certain way. Okay, God, we've done, we've done our job, now it's your job. The death and resurrection of Christ shows us that it is Christ that is the initiator. We simply respond. Now we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Our the sin that is that can come into our life separates us from God. That has been the case since the garden. Sin separates, salvation reconnects. So no matter what we are faced with, no matter what habitual sin is in our life, salvation is and repentance, forgiveness is available. Our young people, as they go to our youth groups, there's that invitation for you young people that you have the opportunity for those that know Christ to grow deeper. But for those that don't know, I give you permission Ask as many awkward and uncomfortable questions. If God is real, why does suffering happen? Ask, ask Graham, ask me that question. Make us uncomfortable because it ha we have to be uncomfortable. We have to be uncomfortable. As we pray for our young people, we pray knowing that God will may lead them and guide them and all aspects of their schools, whether that is the academic side, their schoolwork. Some of our young people may find the schoolwork a lot easier. Others might find it quite the opposite. But our prayer should be that may they know God's peace, may they know God's comfort, and that may they experience the resurrected God, the resurrected Christ in their life. We intercede as a church for our community. We intercede, we intercede prayer as stepping into the presence of God, knowing that the presence of God is always, we're simply responding. We are responders to, what, to God's meeting, God meeting with us. And when we meet with God, we pray and we intercede. As Graham and Emmanuel led our prayer time, we intercede it's a great list, but God knows the nuance and the, the fullness of all of that list. For those who are praying, we don't need to go into detail. God knows the detail. That's the beauty of prayer is that we can go before God and give him certain things. And say, God, I'm going to give you the title. I'm not going to go into detail because I know you know the detail. As we look at starting our youth group, we want to see the trans transformative power of our prayer within that community. As we pray for our thoughts, we want to see God's Spirit move in the lives and hearts of the families in attendance. Not that they know God's peace, that they may know God's salvation. My prayer isn't that praying for someone's peace is a good thing. It's not the first thing. Their salvation is the first. So we pray for their salvations. Our young people, they will face a myriad of challenges at school. My hope is that they, that they may they build relationships with one another. May, as young people, you have the opportunity within our youth groups to share with one another, to grow with one another. 
And when you feel peer pressures and the societal expectations and pressures around you, may you know God's power in your life. Through prayer, we create an atmosphere of support. We create an atmosphere of encouragement that empowers all of us to stand the test of time. To be a Christian without prayer is no, possible, is no more possible than being alive without breathing. Martin Luther. So in essence, if we're not breathing, we're not alive. If we're not praying, we need to think about whether we're alive or not. It's uncomfortable. As we look at the diaconate elections, we pray for discernment. We pray, God, who are you laying on my heart? May I say God's answer to that prayer doesn't give you justification to nominate someone without their permission and consent. So may I encourage you that if God has placed someone in your heart, chat with that person. Chat with that person. Permission is critical. It's important that we seek God's guidance, God's guidance in selecting deacons. May we ask God, okay God, we ask you took us through a process of searching for a pastor. In the same way, take us through this journey with a di- within the diaconate. Lead us. Help us to pray for the current diaconate and the future deacons. As we look at membership classes and as we look at baptism, pray and encourage people. Those within our congregation that we know are considering, pray for them, pray with them. Ask God to lead them. Prayer delights God's ears. When we pray, it delights God's ears. It melts his heart and opens his hand. God cannot and will not deny a praying soul. God cannot and will not. Prayer in its essence is more than mere words uttered into the void. It is a sacred conversation between the created, us here, and the creator. The finite and the infinite. It embodies our direct line to God. A channel through which we express our joy, our fears, our hopes, our doubts. May we understand that prayer is the foundational cornerstone with Christ and through Christ of our faith journey. It is that lifeline that connects us to the transform- transformative power of Christ granting us profound privilege of approaching the throne of grace with unwavering boldness and confidence may our hearts be stirred to leave by God's leading may when we come to prayer we know that when we come That God is already here. That God is already by his spirit in us and working in us. May we know that when we come to pray, it's about praying for interceding for our communities and leaving, knowing that God is leading us. As we leave here today, if we don't leave, And remember the importance of prayer. Then this passage, this sermon is irrelevant. It's pointless. There's no transformational work in it. 
Now, I'm not saying that when I preach, the significance of a sermon is dependent on the works of the listener. May I say, when I prepare, when I write a sermon, my prayers, God, whatever I write, may it be from your leading. Whatever I say, may you speak through me and may you work in the hearts of people. What I'm, in essence, what I'm saying is, God, if you're not speaking through me and if you're not working in the hearts of people, I don't want to preach. I don't want to preach because I'm, I will not be, because I'm called to be a pastor, not a life coach. I don't want people to feel good. I want people to be transformed. I don't want people to think about Christ. I want people to know Christ. I don't want people to consider sharing the gospel. I want people to share the gospel. Why? Because Christ calls us to himself. Christ calls us to be transformed. And by his Holy Spirit, he transforms us. Christ commands us to pray. And Christ commands us to share. There's no option. There's no option. I woke up this morning and I went through this morning breathing. Why? Because it is a natural impulse of being alive. Therefore, my encouragement, my challenge is, what is your natural response as a Christian? Are you praying? Are you reading God's word? Are you spending time with God, getting to know him? That's a challenge for our young people as well, as much as, as, as for us. Where is God in their lives? Where is God in their hearts? Where is God in their focus? And how do we as a church not only pray for them, but walk alongside them? Our young people isn't just the future of our church. They are our church. They are as much as part of the, for those that know Christ, are as much part of the body of Christ as I am. I'm not more superior spiritually. Like a child, I come before God known by Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, as we leave here this morning, Let us leave with a renewed commitment to the transformative power of prayer. Several months ago, as we looked at the power of prayer, may we be reminded of that. May we support one another in prayer, striving for deeper connections with you, our good Father. And may we grow in a stronger bond and unity with our fellow believers here. In Jesus' name, amen.